It is time now for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, and we'll start with listed questions. And can I advise members that questions number one and eight have been withdrawn? Judith Coplin is not in her place. I call Bronwyn McGahan. Question three. Can you? The executive's delivering social change framework includes Bright Start, which is a programme for affordable and integrated childcare. Access to childcare is critical to help parents across the north into work move families out of poverty and to help break the cycle of intergenerational deprivation. Good quality childcare, which provides positive experiences and promotes children's opportunities to develop, is an essential building block for a stable and prosperous future for all. Bright Start is central to helping to grow the economy and to tackle disadvantage, and it involves important actions in which my department has taken a lead role that will benefit rural areas, such as an initiative to take forward a rural Childminder startup package, creating up to 1,000 childminder places. My officials are um, also currently appraising options for how that can be done in a way that delivers maximum impact and value for money for rural dwellers right across the north. Until that process has been completed, it is too early to say at, uh, at this stage how Bright Start actions would be progressed in um, South Stone specifically. However, in terms of um, the previous support that we have been able to make towards rural childcare in South Throne, in 2011, Dard's Rural Child Care Programme supported the refurbishment of the former Eglish Primary School as a new day care centre with facilities for breakfast and after school clubs. I call Bronwyn McGahan. I thank the Minister for her response. Minister, if the childminder start-up places are not fully used up in rural areas, would you give consideration to transferring those places to the, the social enterprise model? And also, what is the time scale for implementation of the Rural Child Care Package? Ken um, for the question. Um, in terms of timescale, the officials are working with OFMD, um, OFMD FM and the Strategic Investment Board to complete the business case for the new initiative. And that business case will then set out very clearly the, uh, identify the relevant timescales. Uh, so I'm hopeful that, um, whilst all that work is ongoing, I'm hopeful that a scheme will be in place and up and running by the end of the year. But absolutely, I think in terms of um, in terms of targets, and if we are unable to meet some of the areas that are identified, I will ensure now, just I suppose, on the back of the, of the um, question that you have raised today around looking at start-ups, we will make sure that is also part of the discussions and moving forward and see if it is potentially something that can be incorporated into the business case now as it is being developed. And can I remind members that this is a constituency-based question? I call Pat Ramsey. I thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister in terms of rural childcare initiatives, does the Minister expect to go, on, to go beyond South Tyrone in terms of developing those in the rural area? Um, yes, absolutely. The Bright Starts programme is aimed at um, the whole of the six counties. Um, Ms McGahan was obviously um, asking a question that was relevant to her constituency, and she's right to do so. But yes, absolutely, the scheme that will be rolling out, and we're working our way through the process now, and hope to have something on the ground. And, um, actually have groups playing into it before the end of the year, and that will be relevant, obviously, for the, all of the area, including Derry. I call Daki Mackay. Kahar, question number four. Access One of the Rural Development Programme provides funding for rural businesses, skills enhancement and competitiveness. Farmers in North Antrim have been awarded £2 million under the Farm Modernisation Programme and a further £479,000 has been awarded under the Manure Efficiency Technology Scheme, known as METS. In addition, nine companies in the North Antrim area have been awarded funding of £2.2 million from the Processing and Marketing Grant Scheme. Under the Skills Training Element of Access One, a total of 531 people in the North Antrim area have been trained under the Collective Training Themes. Under Access Two, farmers in, the North, in North Antrim receive significant funding in return for managing their land to benefit the environment. During the seven-year term of the RDP, farmers in the Agri-Environment Schemes receive just over £22 million for managing their land to enhance biodiversity, protect the landscape and improve water quality. In addition, 1,540 um, farm businesses in the North Antrim area claimed approximately £21.7 million of support through the LFA, Less Favoured Area Compensatory Allowance which helps to ensure continued agricultural land use and therefore contributes to the maintenance of a viable rural society. Forestry grant schemes provide support for new woodland creation and for the sustainable management of existing woodland. Forest Service has spent 814,000 on projects in the North Antrim area. 
For Axis 3, I will interpret your question to refer to the areas covered by the North East Region, the Local Action Group. To date, um, North East Region have invested almost £8 million in North East areas across 317 different projects, including five strategic projects worth £2 million and farm diversification um, projects worth £2.6 million. These projects are helping the rural economy, and on a recent visit, I was particularly impressed with the Moyle Council's canoe trail, which was already attracting visitors from Scotland and from Donegal. I call Dahi Mackay. I got a, a last inquiry. Can I thank the Minister and thank her for uh, the continued investment uh, from her department into the North Antrim constituency? Uh, can I ask her if she could provide more detail in terms of the collective skills training? Yes, um, as I said, just in the initial answer, um, quite a, a large uptake of, of um, skills training. A total of 531 people have been trained in collective skills, including 76 people trained in the early um, farm family option skills tranches up until March 2012. The current breakdown is as follows, 119 on ICT training, 86 on BVD awareness training, and 250 on farm safe awareness training. In addition, under the Focus Farms initiative, 3,285 people have been trained on 14 Focus Farms across North Antrim area. And finally, under the mentoring programme, some 2,225 people have attended succession events. I call Robin Swan. You, Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for an answer. Minister, a number of villages in North Antrim have received funding for village improvement plans. Do you think there will be money available and under, under the next rural development programme actually to implement some of those plans? Well, um, I, I'm very aware of the work that's been done right, right across the north in terms of developing the village plans, and I think they've been a fantastic piece of work. But I think a natural progression, obviously, in moving forward would be assisting areas to actually deliver on some of the things that they've identified. The member will be aware that I'm currently going through the process of examining all the consultation responses and then working towards um, making sure that we have a fit-for-purpose rural development programme in place um, for the new scheme. So I'm working towards that now, and obviously um, being able to fund some of the work under the village renewal will be part of those discussions and those considerations and taking final decisions and moving forward on how we can support rural communities to grow. I call Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Could the Minister outline what proposals do DARD have in the new develop, rural development programme to bring forward more projects and sustain them like the North Anthem project? Well, as I said in the previous answer, I'm actually actively working through the consultation responses that we have received and making sure that we have a fit-for-purpose rural development programme in place going forward. I don't need to rehearse to this House that my disappointment around not being able to transfer money into the rural development programme, which would have allowed me the opportunity to um, further enhance rural communities and bring forward a very much a balanced approach. So my priority in the time ahead is making sure that I use the funding that I have from Europe um, to the best effect to make sure that I take on board the views of stakeholders and then put on the table a very much a balanced approach to um, looking forward to the future. And that has to include agriculture, environmental, and then obviously for rural dwellers. So we need a balanced approach to supporting all of those elements of rural communities because each are equally as important. I call Pat Sheaton. Uh, question number five, please. The aim of Priority 6 is to promote social inclusion, poverty reduction and economic development in rural areas. My department's proposals to address the needs identified in our rural areas were set out in the public consultation document on the 2014-20 Rural Development Programme. The proposed schemes for Priority 6 aim to assist new and existing rural businesses, including farm diversification, rural tourism and businesses to become sustainable and to grow. The proposals also seek to combat poverty and isolation through improving access to basic services and supporting village renewal. It is important that the next Rural Development Programme builds on the successes of the current programme to strengthen the social, the economic and the cultural infrastructure of rural areas and create a vibrant rural community. My officials are continuing to develop the proposals for the 2014-2020 programme, including the delivery options with the stakeholder consultation group, which was established to oversee the development of the programme. I call Pat Sheen. Gormai, I've got a last con call. I'll go to Ara Asan Ragrishan. I thank the Minister for her answer. And I wonder, could she tell us what structural changes there will be in the new uh, rural development programme? Gormai. Um, the local government reform programme will see the number of councils obviously reduced from 26 to 11 by April 2015. And DARD has proposed that the leader act local action groups will be reformed in the next RDP in line with the new council areas and boundaries. 
There still would be an option um, available to cluster councils to gather in line with the new boundaries if it was felt that having fewer than 11 local action groups would be more cost effective and easier to administer. There also might be greater impact from the funds in the combined areas. Aligning the local action groups to the new council structures would also mean that there would be no longer um, be a requirement for the joint uh, council committees which were established in the current programme. So there are obviously efficiencies to be made there also. I call Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her previous answer. Um, could I ask the Minister, given the importance of this <coughs> Priority 6 in terms of rural development, could the Minister outline specific monies that will be targeted in relation uh, to uh, Priority 6 in the programme between 2014 and 2020? I can't provide the, the exact figures here today. As I said, it's a process, and we're working our way through that process in terms of developing the programme and then deciding how much monies are allocated to each measure. Although I can give the member an assurance that Priority 6 is a priority for me, and I want to make sure that it is well funded, that it does meet the needs of rural communities that have easily, um, obviously been identified. So it will be considered in the round along with all the other allocations of money to each priority. I also, because I was unable to transfer money into the programme because of the court challenge that was taken, I am now putting it to the executive, and I have put it to the executive, that they need to step up to the mark and also support rural communities, because supporting rural communities is not just the business of my department, it is the business of every department in this executive. I call Sandra Overend. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I wonder, can the Minister um, clarify when the final budget for the 2014 to 2020 Rural Development Programme will, will be known? Again, um, as I said, we are working our way through the process. We know what our European allocation is, and obviously it's a reduction when you compare it to the current programme because of the overall cuts um, from Europe, European level. So I'm working with my executive colleagues to make sure that we can get as much possible executive funding to actually match that fund that we've got from Europe. So that's the process that I'm engaged with, and then that will allow me to take, I suppose, final decisions on, on how we actually spend the money and prioritise the money across the six different measures. So it's still a work in progress in terms of um, the final allocations. We can confirm the European budget, but not the executive contribution at this stage. Moving on, I call Leslie Cree. Question six, Deputy Speaker. Uh, following my announcement to relocate DART headquarters to my preferred location in Ballykelly, officials um, surveyed the staff that are affected. The results indicate 86 per cent, which would be 642 staff, are not prepared to work in Ballykelly. But then within the wider um, civil service, whenever it was surveyed, over 1,100 staff indicated that they would like to work in that area and a further 800 indicated that they would like to consider this, as, this opportunity. I have since announced that not all headquarter posts will relocate to Ballykelly, with um, some will relocate to Lockery with the Rivers Agency, some to South Down um, with the Fisheries Division, and I had previously announced that Forest Service headquarters would be based in Fermanagh. More recently, as part of the development of the HR strategy for relocation, my officials have developed questionnaires which will gather even more detailed information at individual staff level. Questionnaires have already issued to Rivers Agency and Fisheries Division, with the remaining questionnaires to be issued by the 30th of June 2014. So I will not be in a position to provide the full number of staff until all that work is completed. I call Leslie Cree. I thank the Minister for her response. The move affects a number of staff who live in my constituency. I understand the Minister has made her decision against the better judgment of her department and improperly in, in the absence of a business case. The Minister has an accurate forecast budget now being determined for this pet project of yours, and if so, what is it? Well, the member's information is, is incorrect. My officials are engaged with me and working with me on the project. We have been working very hard to bring forward a business case. This is something new. Other departments haven't moved in this scale in the past. So um, we've been working our way through the business case, which has now been agreed, which, which has now been signed off in my department, and we're waiting for discussion at the executive, hopefully over the next number of weeks. So that's the process we're working through. I'm as committed to this project as ever I was. I'll be making sure that we have the move, but I want to have the discussion around the executive table now that we've signed off on a business case. I call Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the Minister will be aware that there is a public sector hemorrhaging of jobs in the East Londonderry area. This commitment to move to Ballykelly has been on the boards now for several years. And I know at the early stage she was quite reluctant to, to support it, but now appears to be fully supportive. She's given a date of June 
uh, for some movement to occur. When can we expect to see the first civil servants from Dard located in Ballykelly? As I said to the member before, and again, as information is incorrect, I have always said that Bally Kelly was a preferred location, and I've actually worked on the business case to make sure that um, we've got to the position that we're in now. So we've went through the process. You can, um, I encourage you to talk to your executive colleagues also, because the sooner we can have the discussion with the executive, the sooner we can move forward on the move. I want to have the staff there. We have set out very clearly a workforce plan. This is a massive move. It affects quite a number of staff, so we need to have a very clear um, plan in place. And staff want reassurance, so the sooner the executive agrees that we can move forward, then that's going to be, give that reassurance that staff want to have. We've very clearly set out that we're going to do it on a phased basis, with 400 staff going on um, very quickly, actually, next year. So I think that the sooner we can move forward with the process, I, I want to see that, and I'm sure you can use your influence to also encourage that too. I call Declan McAleer. Uh, uh, does the Minister believe that with the closure of the DVA, DVA in Korean that this will be of benefit to the North West? Yes, I mean, absolutely. And, and there has been a hemorrhage of jobs, not just North West, but quite a number of areas because of the DVA decision. So I have clearly said to the DOE Minister that I want to work with um, him in terms of um, how we can respond to the closure of the DVA offices and how other staff can be accommodated throughout other departments and I know that's something that the executive as a whole are very keen to do. I suppose the, the positive aspect is that there will be a group of people um, from the North West who will obviously be keen to stay in that area for work so if there's any way that we can um, work to, to assist those people then I'm prepared to do that. I've actually asked my permanent secretary to consider if there are any options or any of the Ballykelly posts that could they be moved any earlier that will also then have to accommodate some of those staff. So I'm actively engaged with the DOE Minister and the Executive as a whole on trying to tackle those issues. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the uh, Minister, I th hope, has just given some solace to those 300 workers who disgracefully lost their jobs last Thursday. Uh, can the Minister assure the House and she may well have already done it, assure the House that there is a lot of empty space in County Hall and Corain, and would she speed up the process if that is one of the viable options, and will she set an example now to the other ten government departments to the, come to the aid of those workers who marched through uh, Corain on Friday for their rights? Absolutely, and as I said, and I, and I have said it, um, I want to um, play my role, and I've asked my permanent secretary to look at is there any way we can help accommodate some of those staff. Um, as I said, I have made it very clear to the DOE minister that um, I want to help him respond to the issue. These people are devastated because of their job losses. I think the onus is upon us as executive ministers and assembly to try and accommodate them in, in other um, areas. So I'll not be found short in terms of my commitment to helping them um, to, to find something else. I call Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number seven. My department has not refused to publish the report on the Cross Departmental Working Group on the future of Loch Ness. The report is still a working document which has been updated and further work has been carried out by DECAL during 2013. Until the report is finalised and brought to the Executive, it can't be published. I can advise that the Interdepartmental Working Group was reconvened informally on the 24th of February and that officials are working towards the production of an executive paper for the April executive meeting, and then my department will be leading the way in taking forward the executive decision on the way forward. So I'd be very happy to publish it, obviously, after it goes to the executive, which is um, pretty much within a number of weeks. I call Stephen Ngu. I thank the Minister for her response and welcome the fact that, that we are due to see the publication of the report in, in hopefully in a short space of time. Um, obviously Loch Ness is of regional significance um, uh, and will be of importance to many. Can I, can I ask the Minister what knowledge did she have of the unauthorised quarrying at Loch Ness and what concerns does she have um, about its impact particularly on the biodiversity of the Loch? I can say, and I think it's very clear from the consultation, and it's something I've always known, and any of the stakeholders of the lock would be very aware that there's no overarching management plan, and that's the key problem. So a lot of these things can be happening in the absence of any sort of regulation or any plan around, I suppose, all the, all the issues that go on. So whether that be sand extraction, whether it be the tourism potential in the lock, whether it be the biodiversity, all those issues, the environmental concerns. So in my opinion, one of the things that has to come out, one of the, the first things that has to happen is that we put in, in place an effective management plan 
which will help, um, I suppose, bring together and marry all the interests on the lock and make sure that there's regulation where it's needed. So that, that's where we're at with that at this moment in time. But I think that the problem that you've identified, the very fact that it occurs, is because there is no overarching management. There's not one department with responsibility for the lock. It, it goes across many different departments, and that's something I think that, um, for me personally, I'd like to see coming out of the, the, the review. I call Sean Lynch. I'll get the last can call you. Has the Minister met with all us to discuss this report? Gormay. Yes. Um, well, in the past, I've obviously met with the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure to discuss the findings of the additional research that was taken por forward by her department. I've also um, met with um, Gwyneth Cockcroft from the Managing Director from DCP Strategic Communications, along with um, the Earl of Shaftesbury on the 3rd of March actually this year, just to discuss again progress and the, the initial findings of the report. So um, it's important that we engage with all the stakeholders in moving forward and as I've said clearly, there is a need for a proper overarching management structure and that's what I want to see coming out of the report at the very least. I call Joanne Dobson. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I also thank the Minister for her answers? Um, can she confirm to the House what legal advice she has taken on this issue? And I was going to ask if she met with the what contact you'd have with Shaftesbury State. I think you said you met with the Earl of Shaftesbury in March. So um, basically around the legal advice on this issue, what, what she has taken? No, I haven't sought any legal advice. Obviously the piece of work that we've been involved with has very much been a scope and exercise, taking a look at um, what are the, poten what are the potential um, avenues we can explore in terms of Loch Ness, looking at the issue of public ownership, looking at the need for an overarching management structure. So there's been quite a lot of homework done across both my department, the Interdepartmental Working Group, and indeed from DECAL, from the very significant piece of work that they have done. So um, there's been no need to seek legal advice. Uh, in terms of um, meeting the Shaftesbury Estate, yes, I've actually met them on a few occasions, but most recently, just last month, just to, to continue to have discussions around look into the future and how, how they, because they obviously as a key stakeholder in the lock would have, um, want to play a, a part in terms of moving forward with any kind of new management structure. I call Patsy McGlone. Uh, I listened with intent there to hear that she had met, the Minister had met with the, the Earl of Shaftesbury and, and I know there have been calls publicly made to acquire um, the, the rights to the lock and to actually take over into public ownership the rights to the law from the Shaftesbury estate. Uh, could the Minister uh, advise if in fact she has either set aside any funding in respect of this or made any case to the executive in respect of that acquisition? No, because it will be preemptive. Um, what we've done, as I said very clearly, we've done the, the scope and work, we've looked at the potential, we've looked at the problems, we've looked at how do we improve things for the future. And, and, look, and one of the things that was very clearly talked about at the start was one of the options would be bringing the lock into public ownership. So what I intend to do now is when we um, finalise the report, which hopefully will be the start of next month, bring it to the executive for discussion. Um, I've clearly said that I'm content to take the, the lead in terms of moving forward with any new structure that comes into play. But I also, um, if the outcome of the executive discussion is around public ownership and there's a decision that that's something that the executive wants to do, I'd be very happy to bid for the money. I call Paul Frew. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Speaker. Uh, question number nine. To date, 680 businesses subject to inspection using control with remote sensing have been processed for payment. This represents the majority of businesses subject to a remote sensing inspection. My department is working diligently to process the results of the remaining inspections for payment. It is intended that all remaining businesses will have their inspection results processed for payment by the end of April. This means that inspected businesses will now will have their, um, received their single farm payments two months earlier than last year and four months earlier than the year before. In overall terms, 97.4% um, of single farm payment claims have been finalised since the opening of the payment window on the 1st of December 2013. The department set its highest payment target ever for December 2013 at 85% and obviously significantly ex exceeded it by um, finalising 90% of claims. More farmers received their single farm payment in December than ever before. The value of single farm payments made so far is $260.24 million and is a vital element, obviously, of farm incomes. The significantly improved payment performance this year is a welcome boost for the farming industry and the wider rural economy. However, if you are a farmer who is waiting for a payment, I understand the acceptance circumstances that you find yourself under, and I can only give assurance that we are working to have all those people paid as quickly as possible. 
I call Paul Free. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Minister says, stated red in her answer that the majority of farmers have been paid who were uh, involved in the, uh, remote sensing, 680. Minister, that leaves 459 of those cases still to be paid. That is a very slim majority indeed and, and a very flippant response. Out of those 459 uh, single farm payments still to be paid. Does the Minister realise and recognise that she has let those people down? She has let my constituents of North Antrim down and she has failed once again the farmers of this uh, country? No, I don't agree. Um, I can say that for anybody who hasn't been paid, I absolutely emphasise with what you're going through. I absolutely understand. I have spoken to some of these people myself. But the reality is, you put it in context, we are paying people four months earlier than ever before. This has been the best year for payments. I will always contextualise that by saying, if you, were, if you haven't been paid, I totally understand the frustration that you feel. I can assure you that anybody who's listening to the, the question time today, and I took the, measure, the steps to assure as many people as possible that we're working around the clock to try and get the rest of these payments out as quickly as possible. We've had staff in and overtime. We've had working around the clock to try and get the, the rest of these payments processed. I think that you have to recognise that it has been a better year. We are four months way ahead compared to the last two years. So there has been significant improvements made. There will be even more improvements made next year. But I will always say, put it all in context, that whilst it has been a good year on the whole, with 97.4%, if you're waiting to be paid, I understand that you're under stress. I call Oliver McMillan. I call you, and can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Can the Minister tell us, have these payments been prioritised? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm doing regular meetings with my officials every other day, um, getting updates on the numbers that have been paid. I'm chasing um, the department all the time to make sure that we're doing absolutely everything that we possibly can to get the remainder of these cases paid. We have um, department staff in working overtime, they're working weekends, they're working evenings, and all in the aim to try and get these payments out as soon, or, as, soon as, uh, as absolutely possible. So I can give that assurance to anybody that's waiting on their payment. We are aiming to get to your payment as soon as possible. I call Jim Allister. Uh, does 680 <coughs> process for payment, is that the same as 680 actually paid? And in regard to the remote sensing, the inspections that have been carried out there, have they thrown up any identified failures on the part of farmers uh, so that we can evaluate whether there was any worth in that inspection process? Can she give us the figures of the percentage of, of problems that we find? The priority at this moment in time is making sure that we get everybody paid as soon as possible. And I'm going to keep putting in context, people are being paid four months faster compared to 2011. So 97.4% have been paid, a um, significant amount of money into the rural economy. The member will be very aware that we have to, by European regulations, we have to inspect 5% of cases. The, the reason that we moved to remote control sensing is that we could speed things up, and that it is going to work, and next year we'll be in an even better position again. So the, the issues that have been identified or the general issues that come up on, in terms of inspection, is there an analysis at this stage of any of the issues that have thrown up? No, because we're prioritising the work, getting the payments out as, um, as quickly as possible. In terms of the 680 people that have been processed for payment, there may be some money that's been waiting to go into bank accounts, but 680 have been processed. The button has been pressed to send the money on, so as soon as it gets into their bank accounts, which can take obviously a number of days in some cases. I call Ross Hussey. Question 10, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Funding for the Rural Development Programme is drawn from a number of sources. We know that the amount of funding allocated to us from Europe for the next RDP is approximately €227 million. Euros. This is a 14% reduction compared with the 2013 allocation extrapolated over the seven years of the programme. As you are aware, to supplement this um, reduced allocation, it had been my intention to transfer 7% of the Pillar 1 direct payments um, allocation into Pillar 2 to help fund the rural development um, activities. I intended that this transfer rate would have provided an additional €137.5 million Euros approximately to the rural development programme budget. Following the legal um, action then that was instigated by the Finance Minister, that's an option that's no longer available to me. I am continuing to discuss with my officials how much money from DARD's own budget can be used to fund the programme. In the absence of any transfer of funds from Pillar 1 to Pillar 2, the Executive obviously has a greater role to play in making the funds available to bridge the deficit. The RDP will be a key tool for delivering on the aims and objectives of Going for Growth, including the Farm Business Improvement Scheme proposed by the Agri-Food Strategy Board. 
I will need to draw on additional funding from the Executive to fully deliver on the aims and the objectives outlined by the Agri-Food Strategy Board. Given the increased pressure on the RDP budget, a positive response from this um, from the Executive is now more vital than ever. The main objective is to put together a balanced package of funding for the next Rural Development Programme to ensure that we improve the competitiveness of our agri-food industry, protect and enhance our environment and countryside, and improve the quality of um, life in our rural communities. Members, that is the end of oral questions, and it is now time for uh, topical questions when we shall have 15 minutes. Questions number one and two have been withdrawn. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, recently, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I visited, along with other colleagues uh, associated with the Assembly Business Trust, a number of plants engaged in the agri-food uh, sector. And, uh, we were impressed by the work that they were doing. But in order to produce the food that is necessary for the food processing, it's, one needs a good and skilled workforce. The would, the minister, would the minister uh, consider expanding the number of courses, the range of courses and the number of students uh, at CAFRE? Uh, and would she indicate uh, the time scale in which she might do that? Well, in terms of the courses that we offer at um, our agriculture colleges, they are based on um, discussions with the industry around identified need. Um, and the member might be interested to know that actually our colleges are oversubscribed. So we have more people applying to be part of food and agriculture than ever before. So that's something that's very positive because I think for me it shows that young people see a future in the agri-food industry. So that's something that we need to um, support and enhance. But in terms of looking towards new courses, again, as I said, we engage with industry around what are their identified <coughs> needs, and I'm very happy to, um, to, to do that because I think that there's no point in us running courses that are, aren't providing opportunities for people whenever they come out with a qualification. I call Lord McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for her uh, detailed answer and sympathy, really, with what I was saying. But given the fact that there is such demand, uh, will the Minister consider expanding the number of places available for people in, uh, in CAFRE uh, so that we do have that skilled workforce that I'm talking about? And uh, w would the Minister consider looking at that immediately rather than leaving that uh, in the long run? Well, I can assure you it's more than sympathy. Um, I've been working very closely with the agri-food industry. We have developed a, a plan, an agri-food strategic plan, um, which is looking towards the future. So it's looking at educational needs, training needs. It's identifying all those areas, and that's something that's been done in conjunction with industry. So it's not the department telling the industry what's needed. It's actually a joint piece of work that was taken forward between my department, Daddy Department, and then also the industry. So we actually have a plan in place. We're making sure that our courses are targeted for the industry needs. And as I said, as, as part of that whole piece of work, one of the areas we did look at was education and training. So there's no gaps. If there is gaps, that would have been flagged up as part of that process. So there are areas that, that um, we need to continue to work with the industry around the future growth of that industry up in the 2020, and that's what we clearly have now. It's a plan in place which the executive are hopefully going to support over the next couple of weeks. I call Sammy Wilson. Does the Minister agree with the proposal which has been put forward by the abattoirs to reduce the payments to cattle farmers uh, by £150 for those cattle which have been resident in more than four farms during their lifetime? Absolutely not. I don't. And I've made that very clear to NIMEA, the Exporters Association. I had them in my office um, over the last number of weeks. And I'm also glad that the, Agri the Art Committee have also made it very clear to them that this is not something the industry have asked for. This was done with no consultation with the industry. And it's something that to bring in at this stage, when people are in the middle of their normal process, it's, it's ridiculous. So we've asked them to take it off the table. Obviously, it's a, a, an industry decision for them. However, I've made my views very clear. And I think industry have also made their views in terms of the farming um, sectors have made their views very clear to them. This is not something that we want to see brought into place. Because I think if there was to come in now, what will come next? So if you bring the movements down now, next year it will be even more again. And the, the, I, I think for me, it's very clear that this was something that was done, just decided, let's put more pressure on the farmers, and that's not something that um, I, I would be sat to support. Sammy, well, for I'm pleased with the answer that the Minister has given, uh, but can she tell us what specific action she intends to take within her department, and in fact, can her department take any action to ensure that the industry is not hit 
with this um, further penalty, uh, which will be very, very detrimental to cattle farmers in Northern Ireland. As I said, I mean, I've made my views very strong. I don't have any control over NIMEA. It's outside of um, government, obviously. But I've made my views very strong. All the stakeholders have made their views very strong. So you would like to think that they will go away and take a, a fresh look at the decision, which they indicated they would do, however, made no promises, and I, um, I can't speak for them. So um, we, we'll see what they do. I mean, at, at, at a time where beef prices are falling, it's such a, it's such a difficult time for the farming community. And to bring in this extra, um, you know, burden upon them is just not something that's acceptable because well, the member will be aware, the finance minister, the, the price that farmers receive for their meat is obviously outside of my control. However, in terms of practical supports, I'm um, very keen to make sure that we work with farmers around cooperation, how they can work together to be a stronger voice. We can look towards um, improving efficiency in the chain. So all of those practical measures I can get involved with, unfortunately, pricing is outside my control. But in terms of whatever I can do and making sure that I'm a strong voice for their needs, then that's what, that's what I can do. I call David Hildage. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And, uh, at the weekend, I was made aware again of some local uh, crimes against the rural community, one involving farm machinery and, and another involving horse, horse box and tag. Uh, well, well, I know it's a PSI matter crime. Can the Minister give an assessment of how crime is currently affecting the rural community? I mean, it is an issue. It's an ongoing issue, and it's something that I um, regularly, regularly engage with um, both the Justice Minister and also the Chief Constable. Um, there's actually now been a rural crime unit set up, which is something that obviously we welcome and, and we sit on that. So I think it's about collective work, and however everybody individually has their, their role to play. Um, obviously, um, rural crime is an issue for the PSNA, but I think that um, one of the, the, I suppose, a positive thing is that we have a lot more collaboration in terms of, um, I suppose, investigations and things that are ongoing with everybody working together. I think that will obviously lead to more successes. I call David Hildage. I was speaking to thank the Minister for her answer. Setting aside the collaborative working, can the Minister indicate what support the rural community are receiving in this matter directly from the Department? Yes, as I said, um, we have um, a person now who is appointed to sit on the rural um, uh, steering group. We have um, an enforcement unit, so depending on the issues that you are dealing with, because there is rural crime, there is agricultural crime, there is cattle theft, but there is also machinery theft, which is of, of obviously of a, very much of a criminal nature, and you find a lot of these things are because of criminal gangs and what have you. So, Collaborative working is actually key in terms of moving forward and everybody, because you might have Food Standards Agency involved, you might have PSNA involved, you might have this department, you might have environmental health and councils involved, particularly when it comes to food crime. So um, collaborative working is obviously key. I call Jim Allister. Is there a price-fixing cartel in operation between the meat plants in Northern Ireland, which is having the current devastating effect on prices to farmers? Again, as I said earlier in, in the previous answer, the price that farmers receive for their produce is a commercial matter. It has nothing to do with me. However, I will make sure that whenever it comes to dealing with people like Nymea, who in this instance are trying to bring forward um, these changes, I will make sure that I will be the voice for the farming community, and I have done so in this instance. In terms of whether or not there is a cartel, I suppose it is speculation. Does the Minister not need to do a lot more than that? Is not it patently obvious that there is a cartel, and is not the synchronising over the action of re uh, reducing prices for cattle with more than four movements, an indication of that collusion between the meat plants, all directed at driving the prices down. Now, as champion for the, the agriculture industry, what does the minister intend to do about that? Well, I think I've I set it out in a previous answer. Um, I'm con like I have sort of, in terms of working with the industry, we need to look at how we can grow the industry into the future. Pricing is one of many factors that impact on the farming community. I have always said we need fairness in the supply chain. The farmer can't be the person that is continually squeezed. In this instance, again, the farmer is the person that is continually squeezed. So, in terms of mo moving forward, we need to be a strong voice. We need to work together in terms of challenging the meat processors and making sure that farmers receive a fair price. Because the only way we are going to have a sustainable um, agri-food sector into the future is the farmers are treated fairly in the supply chain. And if we don't have fairness in the supply chain, then the, the industry is under threat for the future. So I'm competitive to um, play my role, which is why we have an industry um, government strategic partnership, which is why we have an agri-food strategy in place, which is why we're looking at all the issues that need to be addressed and working together to try and address those. I call Paul Gervin. Thank you. Minister, there seems to be an element in our community that will follow criminality in no matter what area. 
uh, that happens to be, should it be stealing, stealing of machinery. But in relation to uh, illegal slaughter, uh, what investigations are ongoing and how are those progressing with the Department? If the member is referring to the recent investigation, the South Armagh um, slaughter plant, there's, it was obviously a, uh, very much a multi-agency operation, so the PSNA were in the lead as part of the ongoing efforts to tackle um, um, agricultural crime. This investigation covers both um, public health, for which the PSNA and um, Newry and Warren Council have responsibility, and animal health, which is obviously the responsibility of DARD. So again, this was collaborative work in terms of taking forward an investigation. And, and I always like to make it very clear that the reputation of our industry is second to none, and the traceability of our food is second to none. But unfortunately, in every um, community, you're always going to have, um, no matter what it is, there's always some element of criminality, as you've said. So it's important that we tackle it head on. There's an ongoing investigation, and I want to make sure that um, my department plays its role in whatever shape or form. In this instance, the PSNA were in the lead, and we give them every support that we should, because things like this, instances like this, can have damage to the reputational nature of the high-quality food that we do produce. I call Paul Gervin. Thank the Minister for our answer. Uh, how, how will we bring confidence back into the industry and, and also how does this type of activity uh, impact upon the wider agri-food industry? Yeah, I'm always very keen to say, and particularly throughout the horse meat um, scandal, I was always very keen to say that we had the highest quality food. We could stand over traceability of our food because of the Farm Quality Assurance logo that we can put in all our food. However, Instances like these, which can involve a criminal element, do tarnish the reputation of the high-quality produce that we have. So we need to drive it out, and we need every partner who's involved, so whether that be the PSNA or my department, Environmental Health, to work together to make sure that we drive this out, because it does reputationally damage um, the good, high-quality food that we have to offer. I call Sydney Anderson. Uh, Minister, can I ask what progress has been made on the catch, test and release scheme for badgers in your efforts to help eradicate uh, bovine TB? Well, obviously, I'm very um, committed to making sure that um, we deal with the, the wildlife issue. We have um, quite a, an expansive piece of work ongoing in terms of working up the modelling for the new scheme and what it is that we can do. And I know my officials are actually going before the Art Committee, I think, very soon actually to discuss that even further and give more detail. So we've done a lot of scoping work, we've done a lot of modelling, and then we're looking towards rolling it out very shortly. I call Sydney Anderson. Well, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for that response. But you know, this has been an issue that has been around for some time, and this could be a bit of uh, good talk in relation to uh, what is being done, which, which I believe more needs to be done. But uh, can I ask the Minister today, when will she get a handle on this particular issue, uh, on this very, very important issue, and get this uh, issue addressed with some urgency? Thank you. If it was an easy problem to solve, I would have solved it by now. Um, TB is such a complex disease. It's multifactorial. There's no simple solution or quick fix to it. That's been the case right across Europe. So if, we had a, if there was a, a tried and tested method to deal with TB, then I would go and take that method and implement it here. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So we're looking very closely at what other people are, what other areas are doing. We're working up our own TVR approach, which actually had the support of um, obviously the Badger um, lobby as well. So it's very important that when we're moving forward, that we take on board all of these interests. So, as I said, there's no simple solution or quick fix. If there was, I would have done it by now. I call Ian Milne. Very good. Last one, Collier. Can the Minister cl clarify if she is willing to be flexible in the reservoir bill uh, so that small reservoir owners and community organisations will not be unduly burdened by the proposed new legislation? Um, yes, um, I'm very open to listening to the views of individuals and, and also of, of the committee members. And I know that this issue is something that's um, been raised very early on in, in the legislative process. Um, so yes, I suppose the simple answer is yes. I'm open to listening to the views as part of the um, committee scrutiny process, and, and I look forward to engaging with the committee on how we can best um, make this bill fit for purpose and actually meet the needs of the local community. I call Ian Milne. My good last one, Colia Rogers, my wake is down. Ira, good uh, show. Thank the deputy speaker, and I thank the minister for her answer thus far. Uh, as the minister is aware that uh, the capacity is 10,000 uh, cubic metres. Uh, would she be flexible in uh, looking at, the, at, this, uh, at this figure with the prospect of increasing that, uh, that number? 
Yes, I'm, I'm aware that that's an issue of concern for, for particularly for some community groups who are involved in maybe social economy um, enterprises on some of our reservoirs. So it's not my intention in any shape or fashion to bring forward legislation that's going to unduly burden small community groups. So um, I'm very happy if the, consider, the committee would like to consider that further and bring forward recommendations. And I absolutely will be um, open to looking at those and making sure that the legislation is fit for purpose and, as I said, that we don't unduly burden small community groups. And that is the end of questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development.